Good evening. We're going to be uh, doing a study on 1 Timothy for the next few weeks. My name is Bob Clem. Some of you know me. Some of you have seen me. Some of you have no clue what I'm about. <laughs> and uh, maybe, maybe I can keep it that way before we get done. I'm not sure. Uh, a couple of things. On the screen, you're going to see a few handouts, or a few uh, overheads. Not many, just three or four. Most of the information is going to come from a handout that's up here. And so if you want a handout, you can come on forward and get a handout. In fact, if you come forward and stay forward, you can have a candy kiss. <laughs> okay? But you can't have a candy kiss if you move back. So you need to come forward and stay forward. And you get, and then the handout's right here. There's a lot more information in the handout. Now don't go back there, stay up here. That's the point behind this. Those of you who haven't moved, you're going to be sorry you haven't come and got a handout because that's where most of the information is going to be. That's okay. Go ahead. I see a bunch of people coming up here l looking for where the handouts are and then they spot the candy and they don't go any further. That's a... Okay. Why don't you take some of those on back and pass them out to those people back there that uh, are, uh, have got a kink or something, can't move. We're going to be in the first chapter of 1 Timothy, but before we get to the second page, and that's where the lesson really starts, the first page of your handout is more on the line of a uh, piece of trivia and then some background. The trivia that uh, I want to cover is uh, about the nominational world calls First and Second Timothy and Titus the pastoral epistles. This name for, this, for these letters was given in 1726 A.D. That's the first time that the pastoral epistles had their name. Before that, they were called letters to individuals, obviously, Timothy and Titus. Uh, in general, Paul's writings can be divided into uh, two parts, letters to churches and letters to individuals. Today, now, many times we call them the prison epistles, and the pastoral epistles. That takes us to the next piece of information that we're going to be dealing with here, and that is the outline that we're going to be covering. Tonight, we're going to take a look at background, intro, and most of the themes in the first chapter. Then we'll go to the second chapter, chapter, fifth, and sixth chapters. And so that's going to be the outline for the study and how we're going to approach it. Now, to get that done, we have to cover basically two chapters a week. Or two, uh, yeah, a chapter a week. No, a chapter every two weeks. I, I have to do math. And that's going to be tough because some of this information is, uh, is really tough to get done in, in one 45-minute session. 
So we're not going to cover in depth. I told Cleo when he asked me to do this, I said, Cleo, I need 30, 26 weeks. And he looked at me and he says, you've got 13. I went, okay. Can I stay an hour and a half for each lesson? He says, you can stay as long as they'll sit. So <laughs> until I see you get up and leave, we'll, we'll keep talking. No, I'll, I'll get out of here on time. where we're going to be. First Timothy is written to Ephesus. That's that right there. And it was written to First Timothy to the Ephesian church and First Timothy uh, and Timothy obviously, but it was also written after he went to Macedonia. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then there's a couple other places on here that we'll, we'll take a look at as we go. When was it written? Well, that's a good question. What we have is what we call in Scripture peg dates. And we have peg dates around missionary tours. For instance, the first missionary trip that Paul took started about 45 AD. The reason we know that is because Herod's death was in 44 AD. And that's, that's recorded in all kinds of literature. So we know he died in 44, and so the first missionary tour took effect soon after that. The second missionary tour started when Galileo was proconsul, and we know when that was. That was between 51 and 52 AD. That's when his proconsulship was. And the Romans kept pretty good records. So we know when the second missionary tour started. Now, what do we know about the second missionary tour? Well, that's an interesting question because that's going to give us some, some facts that we wouldn't have had otherwise. So what I want you to do is I want you to go to... Uh, first place I want you to go is Acts 14. Acts 14, verse 6. Now, normally, if you're all down here, I'd ask somebody to read. But we'll, I'll go ahead and take care of that for us. Okay? And they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lyconia, Lystra, and Derbe and the surrounding region. Now, who's they? That was Paul and all of the, the people that were with him at that point in time. Now, why do in the world do you care about that? Well, you care about that because when you go over to, to chapter 16, just flip over two chapters, over to 16.1, you read this. And Paul came also to Derby, Derby and Lystra. Where did, he, where did he go just two chapters ago? That's where he was going. And a disciple was named, there was named what? Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman and was a believer, but his father was a Greek, and he was well-spoken. And this is where they, they meet up, and Paul has Timothy circumcised because his father was a Greek. He didn't want to get in trouble with the Jews. And so this is in his second missionary tour. So we know that at the start of this, Timothy is with Paul around 50, 51 A.D. Now, everybody's thinking, is this a history lesson or what is this? Why are we doing this? If you'll hang with me just a couple of more minutes, you're going to see what, why this is important. Okay? All right, so they go from there. And then we go to the third missionary trip, and this is where Paul is at Ephesus, and he stays there in this whole record of Acts 19 and 20, two chapters, he stays there about three years in his second trip, and that's finished, and then he gets ready to go to Rome, and all of this is down in your handout, and, and that's in 59 and 60. So the question is, well, when did he write this thing? You gave us a bunch of dates, and we don't know anything else, so what, what's going on? Well, he probably, according to one of the early church fathers, Eusebius, he died, Paul died under the persecution in 67 AD. Now that means he had to write 
Titus, 2 Timothy, and 1 Timothy before 67 AD. Well, if you back that clock up, and you back it up to where the third missionary journey ended, about 60 AD, then we have probably close to 60, 61 AD, maybe 62, is where Paul was. That's about the right time when he writes 1 Timothy. Now, why is all this important? Boy, you made a big case out of this, Bob. What, what, what is this? Well, let me ask the question that comes to mind. Who's Timothy? Who is he? Well, let's see. Let's read the first few verses of the first chapter of 1 Timothy. The first few verses of the first chapter of 1 Timothy. Paul, an apostle of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior and Jesus Christ, who is our hope. Notice Paul gives a pretty good resume here. To, my, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So in the first two verses, we find out, number one, that Paul is an apostle of Christ Jesus according to the commandment of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is our hope. And he's writing it to Timothy, his true child in the faith. Now, those of you who've studied 1 Timothy maybe a few years ago, maybe even more recently, I don't know, will know that 1 Timothy is going to deal with women in the church, leadership in the church, discipline in the church, false teachers in the church. Nod yes, please. That's what he's going to be dealing with, all right? Those of you who are not nodding, are you asleep or what? Okay. Now, now here's, the, here's the question. Timothy has been with Paul for over 10 years. He's been with Paul for over 10 years. Do you think Paul has not talked to Timothy about these topics in those 10 years? What did they do? Just talk about the weather as they're walking along the road? No. Timothy has probably been pretty well indoctrinated in these different issues, then why is Paul taking the time to give a short resume of who he is and why, why this is true? Well, it may be because he really didn't write the letter just for Timothy. He, he wrote the letter for the church at Ephesus. He wrote the letter for the church at Ephesus. Now, thinking about all the issues that we've just talked about that we're going to find here in 1 Timothy, do you remember what happened in Acts, the 20th chapter? Okay, let's go to Acts 20. In Acts 20, starting with... Verse 17, we have Paul's farewell address to the Ephesian elders. Now, this is when he's on his way back to Jerusalem, and from there he's going to go to Rome. So, but what's this all about? Well, he's, he's basically telling them that I didn't hold anything back from you. I told you everything I needed to tell you. And, but now, you're not going to see my face. I'm going down now to... Uh, Verse 27, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Now watch 28, forward. Be on your guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things, and draw away from the disciples after them. You know, before we even get out of the first chapter, he's going to name two of those guys. Before we even get out of the first chapter of 1 Timothy, he's going to name two of those guys. Let's go back to 1 Timothy, first chapter. He says, this is going to happen, guys. When I leave... And I've been gone now probably for a year and a half since I was there 
for the three-year stint, I was over in Macedonia. Now I'm on my way back to Rome. He says, this is going to happen. What's he say down here? <sighs> Verses 18, 19, and 20 of the first chapter. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecy previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are who? Who? Who are they? Yeah. So he's already naming two of these dudes that are causing a problem within the church at Ephesus. Within eight years after he's left, and this is within, what, 30 years, 30-some plus years after Christ? Now, what I want you to do is I want you to move over to uh, the third chapter of 1 Timothy just for a second, and we're going to answer the question. Fourteenth verse, third chapter, 1 Timothy. Here's the reason why he's writing. I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So why did Paul write the letter? To Timothy? Yeah, so that Timothy not only would know how, but everybody else in the church would know what. This is how you're supposed to operate, guys. This is how you're supposed to conduct yourself. These are the guidelines I'm giving you. Now, <laughs> interesting about Ephesus. It must have straightened out after Timothy had been there. Because we don't read much more that it gets worse. But I do want to, to call your attention to something. I want you to go to Revelation. Revelation, the second chapter. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this. Now, if you go back to the first chapter of Revelation, you'll know who that is. That's Christ, okay? I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. So it seems like they've done something really quite well here. But watch what happens. And you have perseverance, and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. What do you think that means to a church like Ephesus? What do you think that means? Or what do you think that means to any church? That you've lost your first love. Okay. No, if no one starts to answer, there's one thing that you need to know about me. I call on people. Whether I know who you are or not, doesn't matter. I'll get to know you that way, one way or another. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the question, what do you think this means? They've forgotten the gospel. Okay. Or they've forgotten what? The love of Christ. They've forgotten the love of Christ. They've what? They forgot their first love. The passion, the fire that you have when you first become a Christian, it sort of goes, old age sets in, right? Don't, don't anybody talk to me about old age except maybe, where's Tyrone? He can. Okay. But, you know... So, so it looks like the Ephesus church has sort of been, it went, it had a big warning, it went down, had Timothy there, and it came back up for a while, but then by 30 years later, by revelation, it's down again. It, it, all of those things are true. It's done all the right stuff. 
But it hasn't done it with love. It hasn't done it with the right motive. And we're going to see that as we see 1 Timothy. We're going to see what that's all about here. Okay? So let's go back to the text. So Timothy is written first and foremost to Timothy, but it's written to the church. It's written to everybody in the church to show that Timothy has total apostolic support for what he's about to tell him to do and how he's going to tell him to do it. And there's ample evidence that these two characters, Alexandria and uh, Emmaus, is, there's good evidence that they might have been in leadership. And we'll see, we'll see why, because the, the congregation didn't seem to be able to do much with it. Wow, time does fly. Okay. This will take you to your second page. We're going to start with verse 3, and I'm going to go through verse 11. Verses 3 through 11. First Timothy. So as we do this, here's, here's what's going to happen. We're going to have to do this one more time, I guess. Yeah, here we are. This, this is the theme. That'll be the last one we have tonight for the overhead. So that's good. False teachers aren't new. They aren't new at all. And we're going to find that out here in just a second. Starting with verse 3. As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct men, certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which gives rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. Okay, let me stop. There's a couple of words here, and there's some things that we need to clear up. I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may certain men not to teach strange doctrines. Anybody else have a different reading for that? A different uh, translation? Pardon? False? False teaching, okay. What about the word instruct? Anybody else have another word for instruct? Command. Command. And that's, that's dead on. That is dead on. This, this was not, I want you to just go talk to them and tell them what's wrong. No, no, no. I want you to go command them to stop teaching false doctrine. Whoa. That's what he wants Timothy to do. Now you begin to understand why he gave the background that he gave and what's going on here. Timothy's going to have a big job ahead of him. He's got to go tell the church, and probably a few of these people in the church, hey, you stop. Stop what you're doing. Because it's false doctrine. Woo. That's number one. And then what's the second part of that? Well, it's in verse 4. That's in verse 4. And not pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. So, if I had to, uh, this not pay attention, that's another, uh, that's another interesting phrasing. Not pay attention. <laughs> uh, get your brain off of it. So here's what, here's what the two pieces are. How do two, how does verse 3 and verse 4 come together? Read it as a group. Just stop listening to me. Don't look up. Look at your Bible for a minute and read those two verses. Okay, we got it? All right. Now, how do three and four mesh together? Anybody got an idea? How do they mesh together? Much of the myths and genealogies are false doctrine. Okay, much of the myths and genealogies are false doctrine for sure. But look at, look at what's being commanded. Here, here's, here's the issue. Stop doing 
What are they to stop do? What are they supposed to stop do? Okay, they are supposed to, he's supposed to tell them, stop teaching. Now, get your mind brain set up. Get off of thinking about it, meditating on it, and stop thinking about it. So, what, what does that tell us today? What does that tell us? If, if I were to tell you, if I were to tell you uh, to stop teaching whatever you're teaching, and not to pay attention to some other stuff, what have I just told you to do? Get your mind off of this and stop acting like this. Stop acting like this and get your mind off of that. Wow. That's a complete unity. Because, let me, uh, let me show you. Let's go to uh, Colossians. Second chapter. Let's start with uh, verse 2 in, towards the back end. That their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in the true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself. In whom what? Are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will what? Delude you. By the way, that... that phrase, delude you, is in something in the original language we call middle voice. What's, what's active voice? English, what's active? You do it, right? The subject does the work. Okay, what's passive? Okay, the subject is acted on, right? That's the difference between active and passive. We don't have this thing, middle voice. You know what the middle voice is in the language this was written in, Greek? It, it basically is you do it to yourself. You're doing it to yourself. And so what he's basically saying here is this. I say this to you so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. He's not telling them that someone's operating on their brain and making it happen to them. He's basically telling them, you're listening to this junk and you're doing it to yourself. You're listening to this and you're doing it to yourself. Now what do you think he's saying over here in 1 Timothy? Come on, stay with me. Pardon? Same thing. Yeah, same thing. It's not the same voice, but he's, he, that's basically what he's telling them. Yeah. He's, he's basically saying, look, don't do this anymore and stop paying attention to this garbage. Now, who's doing the paying attention? The guys that are doing the false teaching. You have to do both, people. You have to do both. It's not just good enough to stop what you're doing. You also have to not pay attention to the garbage. You've got to do both. That's the lesson here. You can't do one without the other. What's Romans 12 say? Come on. What's Romans 12 say? All you Romans fans, what does it say? Romans 12, 1 and 2, what's it say? Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. That's the active part. That's what you're doing, presenting your body. Now watch verse 2. And do not be what? Conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. That's the second part. So you got these two parts going. That's what Paul's doing right here. And he's telling Timothy, you got to get both parts into them. You got to tell them to stop, and you got to tell them to not listen to the garbage. 
Not yes. You got it? Not yes. Okay. Now, we may make it. Okay. Reasons to stop false teaching. Hmm. I think we've done a couple of that already. Let's get back into the text. So what are these myths and endless genealogies? What do you think that is? Before you answer, I want you to go down a few verses, and I want to read something else for you. Okay? In verse 7, or we'll start at 6, and we'll pick up 7. For some men, straying from these things, have turned aside the fruitless discussion. And we'll talk about that in a second. Wanting to be what? Teachers of the law, even though they don't understand either what they're saying or the matters about which they make confidence, <laughs> confident assertions. And so, who are these dudes? They're probably Jewish Christians that haven't probably figured it out yet. But what do they want? What is their motive? Hey, I'm a teacher of the law. You know, I think there was another thing they said about Factories and uh, tassels, you know, all of those long things that hang around. And, and why? Because it was a sign of being, you know, I'm part of the in-group. Mm -mm. No. What he's basically saying here is he's saying, uh, you know, these guys are teaching some strange myths and endless genealogies. Now what could that be if we have these guys identified as Jews? What would that be? Who my daddy was. Yeah, who's my daddy, daddy, daddy? Hey, listen, you know, I, I'm not going to disparage anybody about anything about politics. I don't that's not a place up here at all. But I want to give you one example. One little teeny little example. Well, why did you vote the way you did? Well, my grandpa voted that way. And we've always been this. Is that a reason to do anything? Well, it was for these guys. It was for these guys. You see? It's not new, people. None of this is new. We deal with this every day, church. Every day we deal with this. Now, nor pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, verse 4, which give rise to mere speculation. <laughs> uh, that, that's an interesting one. Speculation about who's who. And... <laughs> than furthering the administration of God. Now, what is that phrase, furthering the administration of God? What does that mean? What does that mean? Furthering the administration of God. Anybody have a different translation? What? Can't hear you. Work. Okay, furthering the work of God. Which is what? Now, finish the sentence which is by faith. So what is, how do we further the work of God? Hello, come on. By what? Faith. That's how we further the work of God. Gee. Hmm. You know, we were in, we were in Augusta, Georgia for almost 20 years before we came to uh, the great state of Texas. And one of the things I always used to tell the church there is that if we can do it on our own, then it's not faith. If we can do it on our own, we've got all the resources. We look around and we see all the resources we need right now, right here, in place, to do it on our own. Is that faith? I'm not sure that's what 
Hebrews is talking about, and I'm not sure that's what a lot of other passages are talking about. But that's the whole point. When we further God's work and we step out on faith, you'd be surprised what happens. Many of you won't. You've already done it. Probably multiple times. But some of us are still stuck, aren't we? It's okay. You can all nod yes. I don't need to know who you are. Okay. All right. But the goal of our instruction, verse 5, we may make it to verse 11, I'm not sure. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. The goal of our instruction has three characteristics. So Timothy's been told, this is what you need to tell him to do. This is what you need to tell them, the church, this is how they ought to act. And by the way, the goal of this instruction is love with these three characteristics. What are they? Come on, what are they? All right, now, what in the world is a pure heart? Mine's okay, I don't know. What's a pure heart? Pardon? Can't hear you. Honesty. Okay, in a way it is. In a way it is. You know, when the Bible speaks, in the New Testament especially, speaks about the heart, it's talking about your brain. Did you know that? That's what it means, the brain. And when you want, you want the, the seat of emotion for the Hebrews, the seat of where all your emotion comes from when you, when you read the Hebrews, <laughs> you know where it is? It's in your bowels. You know why? Because when you get upset, what happens? Ooh, ooh, that gets, that gets kind of growly down there, doesn't it? That's the point. And that's, that's where they considered the seat of the emotions was in the bowels. But to the Greeks, the heart is your brain. That's where, that's where everything stems from. And if you read carefully in Romans 12 and in others, you'll see that that confirms that. Now, so what we're talking about here is a brain that's been cleaned. Now, how in the world? What, what, is, what is that all about? Well, there's a couple of other things we could go to to, to get that. There's, there's a long passage in John chapter 15, and we just don't have the time to get there to it. But uh, there's that, and then there's, uh, then there's Titus 3, 5 through 11. Maybe we can go there. I'm not sure. Let's, I'm not sure we're going to get there. No, this is speculation. No, we'll just, we'll just do this. What's fruitless discussion? For some men, straying from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussion. What's fruitless discussion? What is that? Pardon? It's, it's useless. If there is no meaning to it, it's uselessness, it, it's, there's nothing there. Now, what I would ask is that, you know, when you, when you take a look at uselessness, emptiness, meaningless talk, uh, and when you read what's going on here, for some men straying from these things. Now, the, these things is what? Good instruction, Right? The these things is good instruction. Read it. Verse 6. Good instruction. Then what? Have turned aside to fruitless discussion. Meaning that they were there once. They were there once. But they turned aside. Does that ever happen in the church today? Does that ever happen in the church today? You might want to nod yes. If 
you don't want to nod, yes, it's okay. I'm going to have a lot of candy kisses up here. You guys are going to have to come up here and take some of these things. I cannot, I cannot take that home because my wife will, you know, no, I can't do it. Wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they don't understand. You know what the worst thing is to tell a teacher? And he just told them that. He just told them, these guys, the worst thing you can tell a teacher. And I know, because I've been a prof before, a long time. <laughs> it, the worst thing you can hear is, you don't know anything. You're ignorant. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Ooh, where'd that come from? That's what he said. Although they don't understand either what they're saying or the matters in which they don't even have the background. They don't understand the details, nor do they understand the big picture. In a word, I love that movie, I guess. I've never seen it, but it's called Clueless. They're clueless. That takes us to verse 8, which uh, we're going to read from 8 to 11 now. 8 through 11. And there's a couple of interesting things that happen here. And we've got uh, seven, eight minutes, so we'll make it. Realizing, uh, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, and for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for immoral men and for homosexuals, and for kidnappers and liars and perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. I thought the law had been done away with. Why does he say the law is good? Pardon? It shows, it shows us what is wrong. Yeah, even though it's been done away with, we're not under law, it what? It's used as the moral standard. Instruction. 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 How so? Th this is what happens... When you, when you get to know me, you, you answer a question like that with one or two words, and then I ask, well, why, how, who, where, when? You know, that's my second follow-up question. Go ahead. Okay, so you have to study the old law? Okay. Uh, let's go to Galatians 3.24. Galatians 3.24. Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. How about that? How about that? You know, if you, if you, if you search long enough and you, and you try to figure it out hard enough, the Bible shows you what it means. <laughs> the Bible interprets itself. You probably heard that before, but it does. It interprets itself. Now, there's a, uh, there's a thing here that I've got to ask. But we know that the law is good. Now we understand why. If one uses it lawfully, uh, a better word for that would be properly. If one uses it properly, would be the better word. Anybody have properly there in your translation? Those, those of you who got a mind to go look it up in a dictionary and you'll see 
in the Greek dictionary, you'll see that it's got more than one meaning, and the, and the main one is properly. So here's what it would read. But we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. Ooh, that puts a different light on it, doesn't it? Realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person. Then he goes through with all the bad guys, all the bad stuff. And anybody get thrown by that last phrase? According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which, uh, which I have been entrusted. Did anybody get thrown by that? And where did that come from after listing all those bad people? Well, if you did, let me suggest something. Because it's, it's, the construction is kind of clumsy, especially in some English versions. So let's, let me do this. Hang with me and listen. But we know that the law is good if one uses it properly, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which I have been entrusted. And then the rest of those stuff is sort of like a parenthetical that goes in the middle of it. You get it? You want to hear it again? Or did you get it? Come on, guys. Liven up. Tell me. Is it okay or not? Yes? No? Ah, I got a thumbs up. Two thumbs up back there. All right. What are you guys doing way back there? Come on. You didn't get your candy kisses, did you? All right. All right. Well, I tried. All right. The ending then, in the last minute or so, is what marks a false teacher? What should we look for? Outside of our text, we have four passages. We're not going to read them all. I'm just going to give you the answers. Well, you got the answers probably right there on your uh, sheet, right? False teachers have worldly and empty chatter, meaningless. They preach or teach for profit. They preach out of envy and strife, selfish ambition and impure motives. And they preach a different gospel, seeking to please men. Those are the four majors. You've got a lot of other issues under that, but those are the four majors that you can find these specifics. And you've got these, these four passages that go with that. Any questions on tonight? No questions. Man, I'm either really good or you're really off tonight, one or the other. Go. Oh. Yeah. Milk chocolate and uh, dark chocolate. Uh, that's a thumbs up. Of all the questions, it's all about food. <laughs> Never fails. Never fails. Let's... Uh, Let's stand and have a word of prayer and we'll get out of here.